welcome to India New Year News. Our guest today is Sangeeta Prathan, a well-known nutritionist and dietitian. She has been a fixture at India New Year News Annual Health Expo for the last 10 years. She is going to uh, make her present presentation this year as well. Sangeeta, welcome to our studio. Thank you so much. And uh, we are looking forward to listening to you at the Health Expo. So let's say start with, uh, you know, anybody who watches television these days is flooded with all these ads, losing weight, you know, dive control your A1C3 for diabetes and all this stuff. So what is your take on that? So the FDA has actually approved a few drugs for weight loss. Uh, you may have heard of Orlistat, mm -hmm. you may have heard of Phentermine, but I think the the drugs that have really flooded the market and uh, I should say taken the world by storm and have become sort of the buzzword on social media these days, uh, those are a class of drugs known as the GLP-1 receptor agonists, which is a huge mouthful. But essentially they mimic a, an endogenous hormone that is produced by the small intestine. There's like cells in the small intestine known as the L cells, and they produce these hormones called the incretin hormones. I like to call them the incredible incretin hormones. Mm -hmm. um, they have, they exert their effects in multiple ways in the body. The scientific community is very, very excited about these drugs, but again, with the caveat that a, there are side effects. The long-term effects are not known. So it's not the holy grail. Let's put it that way. Okay. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, diet and uh, diabetes. Sure. And, uh, you know, we Indians are very, or South Asians are very <clears throat> hooked to our Indian, you know, food butt tests. And it is difficult here to, to manage that. So... So if somebody, say, is, is diabetic yeah. and uh, on medicine, mm -hmm. uh, what are some of your recommendations will be for that uh, person? In the, in the, food, in the, in context, the, in of the context of the South Asian diet. South Asian sure. Diet, yeah. So I, it goes back to my original argument about eating whole, unprocessed foods, rich in nutrients and fiber. One of the issues with the South Asian diet is that it's very carb rich. As you know, white rice, um, foods made with, made with maida or white flour, poha, upma, which is a refined form of wheat. What about roti? Roti, uh, the whole grain roti, unless you're gluten intolerant, which is a whole different issue. A whole grain roti that perhaps you make at home with a higher fiber content may be well tolerated. So, but as a rule, the South Asian diet is carb carb rich. Hmm. It's uh, it's top heavy in carbs. Let it let's put it that way. And also uh, bear in mind that the pulses or dals, right, the lentils and the legumes are a great source of protein, but they actually happen to be carbs. Hmm. So overall, the diet becomes carb rich, which means something called the glycemic load goes up. That's simply the extent to which your blood sugar goes up overall after consuming food, right? So if you already have prediabetes or diabetes, that is something that you really need to take into account. The carb load, meaning the quantity of carbs as well as the quality. And that's where we need to make the distinction. All carbs are not created equal. Nutrient dense, high fiber carbs will mitigate spikes in sugar, but they do a whole lot more than that. And if you want, I can elaborate. On so let's, uh, let's start with a breakfast. Okay. So since we have a little time, I just want to be very precise. Sure. So <clears throat> what will be a good breakfast? for a South Asian uh, person who is uh, listed with uh, uh, diabetes? Okay, so first off, we need to understand the underpinnings of a well-balanced diet. Okay. You gotta have, a, because once you have, it's like a formula. Mm -hmm. Once you have the formula, you can plug in your food and hey presto, you have a meal that works with for you that will give you your target blood sugar, but it's doing a whole lot more than that. Your cholesterol will 
improve, your blood pressure will improve. All these metabolic abnormalities that we see will also improve. So make sure you always, this is the formula. There should be a whole grain mm -hmm. at, at every meal. There should be a source of protein. I think people intuitively know that mm -hmm. protein must be included at every meal. Mm -hmm. There should be a source of healthy fat at every meal mm -hmm. and ideally a vegetable. Now, most of us are running out the door at breakfast. And also, of most food. of us do not know which one has a protein, which has a fat. And I think a lot of people are, I, I have absolutely no clue okay. about it. So, for a common person yes. to say that, you know, okay, in the morning, if you're having a breakfast, mm -hmm. you know, paratha yeah. or something yeah, like yeah, that, yeah. Mm -hmm. this should be your diet. So, if you clean in that. Okay, way. so do you, if you want a concrete example, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, one very common and popular breakfast dish in the South Asian diet is upma, mm -hmm. right? Now, the rava ka upma that is made with semolina rava is actually a refined form of wheat. Mm -hmm. So what we do is remember one, think of a three-legged stool. One leg is whole grains. Mm -hmm. Second leg is protein. Third leg is fats. You pull out a leg, that stool collapses. Mm -hmm. Your meal plan collapses, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So how do we switch from a refined form of wheat to a more whole grain form? There's all kinds of options. You can use dalia. Mm -hmm. which is cracked wheat, mm -hmm. which is higher in fiber. Mm -hmm. Or uh, it's also sold as bulgur, B-U-L-G-U-R, in mm -hmm. the regular grocery. Mm -hmm. And a serving of bulgur gives you five grams of fiber. So there you have it. You have a whole grain there, mm -hmm. right? Uh, if you add some peanuts in the seasoning, that's going to give you some healthy fat. Mm -hmm. And of course, we always use oil for tadka or seasoning. So ideally, peanut oil or if you or avocado oil because they have higher smoke points mm. you don't want to use the dark green olive oil mm. right and add a ton of vegetables mm. because vegetables are free they're very low in carbs they have all those antioxidants you know those nutrient dense elements that we are talking about but the peanuts themselves won't give you enough protein so how about a a little bowl of Greek yogurt. Mm. This Greek yogurt can give you a whopping 15, 16, even higher grams of pro higher amounts of protein. A small, tiny. Um, actually, you could do Greek yogurt is particularly rich in protein and relatively low in carbs. Mm. So you could do a good half cup, three quarters of a cup mm. with your upma, nicely seasoned with uh, you know, with curry leaves and mustard seeds green chilies. So spice it up. The turmeric is a very powerful antioxidant, mm. right? So we just created a complete meal that will, that pretty much checks all the boxes, but more importantly, it's palatable mm. and more than palatable. It's delicious. And that's what's really important because I can talk till I'm blue in the face, but people have to follow my recommendations. And to do that, we need to create foods that are appealing okay. to the general public. So what about the foods like breakfast, which is easy? For example, you yeah. take a toast and sure. butter. And yes. So you can get a high fiber English muffin. I don't know if I, I can mention brands here, but there are certain brands that are particularly high in fiber. So you can just do toast the English muffin, slap some peanut butter on it, grab an apple. That mm. took less than 30 seconds mm -hmm. and you're out the door. Okay. Isn't that complete? That's completely balanced. Perfect. You got eight grams of fiber from the English muffin. You got four from the apple. You got 12 out of the recommended 35 to 38. You're almost a third of the way there to your yeah. goal. So I find banana very easy because easy to peel right. and eat. Uh, what about banana or small banana? So first of all, there are a number of myths when it comes to the diabetic diet that I would like to bust sure. at this point. Fruit is not forbidden. Okay. So you can, most folks can handle two or up to three servings of fruit a day. Like a small apple is one fruit, but the big banana is actually considered two fruits mm -hmm. because it's denser. Yeah, yeah. But a smaller banana could be incorporated into the meal plan. But I just want to make one point, if I may. So diabetes, as you might know, is a sort of a, I don't want to call it a double whammy, but it's a function of both insulin resistance and a progressive loss of insulin. Mm -hmm. So when someone has had diabetes for, say, a couple of decades, in other words, with long duration diabetes, the pancreas begins to wear out. So 
These folks might still be insulin resistant, but they also have actually lost the body's ability to produce insulin to keep up with the body's demands. Sure. So what happens is that now these folks become unusually or exceptionally carb sensitive. So if you have pre-diabetes, you might still have a reservoir of insulin in your pancreas. And I'm oversimplifying. Mm -hmm. But if you've had it for 25 odd years and your blood sugars have not been under good control, you have relatively less insulin left in your pancreas. So even when you're trying to eat well, you might see these unexplained spikes mm -hmm. in your blood sugar. So that's where you really need to sit down with a registered dietitian who can map out for you the composition of your meal and help you in engage in something called carb counting. Mm -hmm. You don't go crazy about the whole thing, but he or she will be able to map out a comprehensive meal plan so that we manipulate those carbs while keeping the quality of the meal intact so that your target blood sugars are still achieved. Okay, one more thing on the breakfast. Uh, what about uh, milk or orange juice or mm -hmm. tomato juice or coffee or tea? Oh, whether it's, is that yeah, okay to go, do? Yeah, going with yeah, well, it depends upon which beverage you're talking about. Okay. So milk is rich in protein. It does have some carbs, but it also has the protein to accompany that. So you want to see foods don't exist as isolated nutrients, mm. right? Food is a complex matrix of a diverse variety of nutrients. So milk comes packaged with protein and the sugar lactose. So the protein, to some extent, will mitigate sugar spikes. Okay. So having a glass of milk, if you incorporate that as part of a healthy meal plan, go for it. Orange juice. This is where, again, remember I talked about duration of diabetes, mm -hmm. right? So if someone has relatively less uh, insulin, their ability to secrete insulin has been impaired from long duration diabetes, in fact, they may be dependent on insulin shots. We have to be a little bit more careful yeah. with incorporating orange juice, but we could, you could still reasonably incorporate maybe four ounces or so. Okay. Depends upon what's happening, but I do want to point out, you're better off with the whole fruit rather than the juice, the juice yeah. because the juice goes through your digestive tract much faster, spiking your sugar. What about tomato juice? So tomato juice, uh, it wouldn't hurt to look at the label, okay. but tomato juice is derived from tomatoes and the sugar content is relatively low. The carb content is relatively low. So you may not, you may or may not see as much of a spike with that compared to the orange juice. But the, the rule of thumb should be that no food is really forbidden, but then you tailor it for that patient's needs. Right. One size does not fit all. And again, this is where a registered dietitian could really help provide sort of a GPS, if you will, mm. a navigation tool to sort of navigate this whole process, which I know can be very confusing. Sure, sure. A lunch plan for the Indians with mm -hmm. their diabetes. Sure. So going back to our formula, whole grain, protein, healthy fat, vegetables. So how about we have a couple of high fiber rotis? And what I would suggest is take about two thirds of a cup of your regu regular 100% whole wheat flour, whole wheat atta. Mix one third cup of ragi flour with that to make a very high fiber roti. Or better still, you could do a 100% jowar or bajra ki roti. These are millets. Again, very high in fiber. Now the amount, whether it's two rotis or three, needs to be customized to that patient. But Typically, the, the roti would be the quote-unquote whole grain in the meal. And then how about a, a katori or a small little bowl? I would say maybe one half to three quarters of a cup, perhaps more, again, depending upon the individual's needs of our pulses or legumes. It could be chole. It could be whole mung, whole masoor, ideally sprouted. That is an excellent source of protein, but it also has the dual benefit of giving a ton of fiber. As I said earlier, up to anywhere from 12 to 16 grams of fiber is what you would get from your whole pulses or whole legumes, your protein source. And then of course, in, in most Indian cooking, we do tarka with, as I said earlier, 
avocado oil, peanut oil, and that's the fat in the meal. By all means, you could add peanuts, you could add almonds is as needed, but make sure that you have a large amount of non-starchy vegetables, because as I said earlier, they are free, very low in calories, very high in fiber, nutrient dense, they will hit the spot, keep you full, keep you satiated. Most importantly, your post-meal blood sugars will reflect the composition of these meals. You should be close to target, you know, all things being equal. If you eat a meal like this, again, I would recommend speaking with a certified diabetes educator or a registered dietitian who can assess your needs and then customize the meal plan accordingly. Let's say you're on the run like most of us, and you just need a quick fix. Um, your audience might not like this answer, but plan ahead. Again, it's really easy if you grab, there's all kinds of high fiber breads on the supermarket shelf now. And again, I don't want to mention any brand names. Try to get a bread with at least three to five grams of fiber per slice. And if you are a vegetarian, you could make a chutney sandwich with a couple of slices of cheese, Remember the tomato cucumber sandwich that many of us know so well growing up and you actually have a complete meal there because the cheese is your protein. The chutney adds that little bit of a zing that we all like. And then of course you have your whole grain bread. How about a couple of slices of avocado with that or grab a fruit? So this is if you plan ahead. But of what if you don't? And many of us are caught blindsided and we need to you know, swing by a chipotle. The advantage with the chipotle is that they have beans on the menu. So yay for that. Because as I said earlier, beans are actually a storehouse of nutrients with fiber and protein and carbs, but the carbs are completed with fiber. It's nature's own package, not to mention potassium, magnesium, and so on and so forth. So you could create a bowl with a ton of vegetables, throw in those beans, and if you want a little scoop of brown rice, go for it and that actually is a complete meal again you could add some avocado slices so that would make a complete meal yet another option would be to get a whole grain wrap if you are a non-vegetarian get some sort of a whole grain wrap with some grilled chicken on it and a salad on the side and again you have a complete meal so once you understand these underlying principles behind good nutrition, as I said earlier, it's like once you have the formula, you just plug in the foods and voila, you have a complete meal that will achieve the target outcomes. Uh, what about dinner? So dinner could be very similar to lunch, but of course, you know, you're going to get bored if you eat roti all day long. So one uh, substitute for the high fiber roti that I'd mentioned earlier is to use another whole grain. Quinoa, for example, has five grams of fiber. Bulgur has five grams of fiber per serving. Barley has seven. Farro has anywhere from five to seven. Whole grain couscous has seven grams of fiber. So you could use that as the whole grain. You could still keep your pulses, have a ton of vegetables, and you have a complete meal. Do try to include yogurt because it's a rich source of probiotic bacteria. And it turns out that the gut microbiome, the beneficial bacteria in our gut, these little critters are actually calling the shots when it comes to chronic disease and inflammation in the body. There's actually a crosstalk that goes on between the gut bacteria and your immune system. So if you want a, a mature, well-developed, robust immune response, you want to eat these whole foods because they literally are, the fiber is literally fuel for these friendly bacteria. So including probiotics, including a nutrient dense fiber rich diet is a wonderful strategy to get us, to help us accomplish our health related goals. Sangeeta, uh, it was a great day to outline about plan for the, for the diabetic people for breakfast, lunch and dinner. Uh, if you can also talk about the time, like what should be the gap sure. period? That's a great question. So, you know, we've known all along that what we eat and how much we eat is critical to, to 
to our health. But it turns out the timing of meals is just as crucial. And this has to do with something known as the circadian rhythms of the body. So, you know, we know that as the earth rotates on its axis, we get a 24 hour cycle with a 12 hour day and a 12 hour night. Well, the 12 hour day and night never gets to New England, but never mind that. So also the major metabolic pathways of the body are actually in sync with these circadian rhythms. So the key hormones that are regulating our blood sugar, weight, cholesterol, and, and so on and so forth are actually only released. These key metabolic pathways are operative only during the day because we are diurnal organisms, right? Human beings are diurnal. We are not nocturnal. So insulin resistance is actually at its highest at night and it's its lowest in the morning. So if someone skips breakfast, remember the body is ready for them, but they are not. They just miss the boat. Hmm. And on the other hand, folks who skip breakfast will inevitably eat late at night and they'll backload at the end of the, the day. But are those hormones available? No. It's like the kitchen is closed. There's no night shift. Plus, you're more insulin resistant at night to begin with if you have diabetes or prediabetes. But that insulin resistance is even more pronounced, even in individuals who don't have diabetes. You put two and together, two and two together, and you can see how aligning your meals with the circadian rhythms of the body then becomes a very critical factor in meal planning. Sagita, so coming back to for the timing for the breakfast, uh, lunch, and dinner. Uh, is there any sequence, for example, after X hours you should take a lunch, after X hours you should take a dinner, or do not skip if you skip, something along that line. But can. try not to skip meals at all if you can help it, because the, there's a, a hunger hormone called ghrelin, and it rises and continues to rise till you eat your next meal. So if, a long, if you go for a long period of time without eating, you're just, I mean, it makes common sense. You're just going to be really hungry and more apt to overeat. There's no hard and fast rule as such. But as I said, if everything, if a meal gets pushed back, then all the meals the following that meal will also get pushed back. And now you, you're encroaching into the dark phase of the cycle. Ideally, if you want to keep like a two and a half hour gap between meal and snack, for example, say breakfast, just for the sake of argument, is at say 8.30. Your snack is maybe around 10.30, 11, lunch is at 1 o'clock, 3.30, 4 o'clock is another, like your PM snack. This is all in an ideal sure, world. Sure, sure, sure. And then 6.30 or so is your dinner. Hmm. You want to keep at least a 12-hour gap between your last bite of food at night and your first bite so in the morning. Very, so the key is to make sure that there is a 12-hour gap between your first Ideal. and Ideal. Ideally. Ideally. Perfect. And, and which is quite doable, actually. It's very doable. It's very and doable. And it's because, you know, your body is so engaged in all the metabolic reactions during the day. And there's all this sort of free radicals. And think of it as like debris that is created from the digestive processes. Your body needs a break. Now, uh, a follow-up question. When you were talking about Chipotle, I was laughing. Uh, you said that they serve beans, but they also serve cheese and sour cream and all those stuff. How do you uh, look at them? So I want to just go back to the my first the the first sort of point I had made earlier. No food should be forbidden. Hmm. You know, food eating food and eating is a very pleasurable part of the human existence. So really, no food should be forbidden. So if you if you're doing you know a good bowl of beans ton of vegetables, some avocado. Honestly, a little sprinkling of cheese, a little bit of sour cream. Is that going to be the end of the world? No. It's when we constantly eat foods that are very calorie dense without really being mindful of what we are eating. That's when we can get in trouble. But a sprinkling here and there for flavor, not at all. And I would, in fact, encourage folks to do that because then this effort becomes sustainable. Sure. And it's no longer a diet. So, Sangeeta, thank you very much for your time. My pleasure. And we are looking forward to seeing you at the Health Expo on uh, August 18th at Burlington Marriott in Burlington. So am I. Excellent. Thank you.